There's nothing more exciting than the Christian life lived out. It's about loving unconditionally. It's about forgiving. It's about turning loose of hurts and disappointments you experience in life. It's about giving your life to help others around you have better lives. But sometimes, a Christian will become complacent. You need to look in your own heart and decide, have you become complacent? Are you drifting away? Are you still that vibrant Christian you were when you accepted Jesus as your Savior and you were excited about serving God and you couldn't help but share with others? You couldn't help but look beyond the hurts of this life because you were concerned about others knowing the joy of eternal life as you have known it. The call of John was to write these words so we would have this great message from God. He wrote about Revelation, the need to repent. He wrote to the seven churches and said, you need to come back to your first love. Get excited again. As we looked to Revelation chapter 22, there are some blessings that he starts off with. And chapter 21 and 22 talk about heaven, eternity, new Jerusalem, new earth. Everything's new. And, and there are some who believe that we'll be on the present earth that we're standing on now. And just it's going to be cleansed. It's going to be glorified. It's going to be a wonderful place. No sin, no scars, no hurts, and, and a place where God will dwell. Others think heaven may be somewhere else. I was talking to somebody this week and said, well, I don't believe it's going to be on the earth. And I said, well, that argument is real easy. Wherever Jesus is, that's where we'll be. And so we don't have to worry about where. It's with whom that we'll spend eternity, and that's with Jesus Christ, our Savior. The first blessing we look at is the river of the water of life. Right down the middle of the street. Right down the middle. Imagine if you go to Main Street and there's a, a river flowing right down the middle of the street. That's, that's a very prominent thing. River of life is going to be very prominent. Also, downtown is always accessible. It'll be accessible to us. Right there, the river of life. The angel showed John around the New Jerusalem. It was kind of like a tour guide. He was looking around and seeing things. And he grew up in, in and around Jerusalem and Israel. And yet, all was, it all looked new. It looked different to him. And he was having a hard time describing it. First thing he showed John was the river of life. Life is what the Bible is about. Life. Life begins at conception. And it continues through natural death. And there are so many in today's world who see abortion as just a form of a choice. It's, you want, it's a form of birth control. If you're, you come up and you don't want that child getting an abortion. Now, if you're here today and you've had an abortion, I'm not preaching against what you've done. I would tell you that God forgives you and he restores you and he will give you a peace about it if it's still tormenting you. I would tell you that. And I'd say don't do it again. <laughs> but... The, life, the Bible is about life. And then some would say, if you have some kind of physical deformity, then you ought not to live. But that's not found in the Bible either. Many with uh, physical deformities or even mental handicaps can come to a point of accepting Jesus as their Savior. They're a living soul. And then some would say, when you get to a point, a certain age in life, that you're no longer uh, contributing to society and that life ought to be shortened or if you're sickly, or if you're in a lot of trouble, or have something like dementia, we ought to just end your life. That's not what the Bible is about. And only Christians have the message of life, from conception through natural death. And so the Bible message is about life. And the good thing is, it's not just life on earth, as we know it here. It's about eternal life. You can have life eternally with Jesus. Jesus promised living water to his followers, those who are his disciples. Jesus said in John 4, But whoever drinks the water I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There's a lot of confusion in today's world, and a lot of hurt, and a lot of anger in the world, a lot of uncertainty, because there's a spiritual void in many people's lives, and the spring of water that Jesus offers fills that void. There are many who search for things in life, for meaning of life and purpose in life, and they go from one thrill to another, or one drug to another, or one relationship to another, looking for something. 
And they're not finding it because our need is a spiritual need and it's only filled not in philosophies of the world and there are many religious philosophies. There's only one way to fulfill it and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ that can be had by whoever will turn to him. When a person is saved, they receive living water. Living water represents eternal life, beginning with the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you'll turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior and you'll turn your life to him, you'll receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, his Spirit, God's Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus will live within you and guide you and give you that sense of peace and fulfillment and purpose of living. There's no other source of salvation but Jesus. You can go to a bookstore. And there are hundreds of books on the shelf, self-help books. And they're going to give you a secret on how to have a good uh, area of your life. But you have to buy all those because every area of our life needs a little improvement, a little self-help. Or you can put those, leave those on the shelf and you can open your Bible and read it. And the problem, the reason the Bible doesn't help when people read it is they don't do what it says. You have to open the Bible to read it by faith. Trusting that the words are from God. They've been preserved from the beginning of when they were written. They're good now. They'll be good forever because they're words of God. There are many translations that use different words, English words that we understand, but they mean the same thing. And there's an attempt to get back to the original language and its meaning. But the meaning of the Bible as a whole has not changed from the time it was written or interpreted or whatever else. And the meaning of the Bible still holds today to be true. We don't need a lot of self-help books. We need to open our Bible by faith and read the words that are from God. And they're God speaking to us. It's a living word of God. A second blessing in verse 2. John pointed out was the tree of life. There's a tree of living water and a tree of life. And that's significant. The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. But when Adam and Eve sinned, then God said to the angel... Go and keep them from coming back to the tree. In case they eat it, then they'll live forever in this sinfulness. But now the angel is showing John, he's pointing out to John where the tree of life is and saying it's going to be free to whoever will take it. If you're in heaven, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior by faith. And if you're in heaven, then you can have access to this tree of life and this stream of, of living water. The river of life and the tree of life show us that in heaven it will be permanent where life is found. The number two, and we find gematria or numerology uh, in, throughout the Bible, but from the very beginning, and it's uh, very strong in Hebrew understanding, the uh, meaning word, numbers have, and the number two represents strength or certainty of something. And so we have the tree of life, we have the river of life. There's a certainty of life, eternal life in heaven. Salvation is a sure thing when you invest your life in Christ. When you invest your life in Christ, it may cost you this world's status. It may cost you this world's goods. It may cost you things in this world. This life is short, it's passing away, eternity is forever. But when you follow Jesus Christ, it is certain that you will have life and life eternal. And note also, the tree of life is on both sides of the river. Again, the number two comes up. It's a certainty that there will be a tree of life. It, the tree of life will bear fruit 12 months out of the year. Different fruits each month. There will be diversity in heaven, a variety. Heaven will not be a boring place. I've heard through the years, those who are rejecting Jesus as their Savior, they say, well, I want to go to hell. There's going to be a big party in hell and we'll celebrate. The party is in heaven. They've got it all wrong. In, he in hell, you'll be separated. You'll be alone. You'll be in torment. And it'll be, it'll be horrible. In heaven, we're talking about life, eternal life. Fruit that grows every month, a new fruit on this tree. Variety in heaven. There'll be rejoicing and praising of God. It's going to be wonderful. The party is in heaven. If you want to join the party, join Jesus Christ. It's been said by scientists that they estimate there are around 8.7 million species of plants and animals on the earth. Imagine in heaven. God is such a creator God. Imagine the species that will be in heaven. Now, I don't know if there will be dinosaurs. We might go take a brontosaurus ride every now and then. I don't know. But it may be 
creatures and uh, plants we've never seen before. We don't know. God doesn't tell us a lot about heaven. And one reason is because even if he told us exactly what heaven was like, we couldn't comprehend it because we hadn't been there. We don't understand. It's beyond our comprehension. We just know it's going to be a very wonderful, wonderful place. God created many things for us to see and enjoy on earth, and I think heaven's going to be even more abundant, the joys we have. But all God created, the psalmist attests to it many times in the psalms, all God created leads us to worship and praise him. And that's what it's about. And we'll see his creation and just have more reason to worship and praise God. The leaves are for the healing of the nations. And verse, Revelation 21, verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for former things have passed away. God will heal all people. You have some things in your life, probably, most folk do, that go real deep. A hurt that goes real deep, and a lot of times that hurt goes way back. It's still there. After all these years, you've learned to cope with it, but it's still there. A hurt. In heaven, that's not going to be there anymore. You can't imagine life without that hurt, without that pain, without that just gnawing deep down. And in heaven, it won't be there. There'll be so much joy welling up. It's going to be so good. It'll be a peace. It'll be a joy. It'll be a, a happiness like you'd never believe. All the scars of our own sin will be healed. All the hurt we receive from others will be taken away. All the regrets we might have will not be there. It'll just be a place of good, pure worship of God. Someone posted on Facebook recently. And I think about this when I say it. When the Apostle Paul entered heaven, all the people he persecuted and killed shouted for joy that he was there. Think about that for a minute. When we get to heaven, those who have hurt us, when we see them in heaven, it'll be the grandest sight. Everybody we see, we look at the mass murderer that accepted Jesus right before he went to the execution. And we'll see him, we'll rejoice that he's there, or she's there. All the things that have done, people have done bad things all through their life, if they accepted Jesus and they're in heaven, it'll be a time of rejoicing and praising God that they're there. We can't imagine some people being so evil in this life. But the Bible says if they will turn and turn to Jesus and accept him and turn their life to worship and live for him, they will be saved, as we all are. A third blessing uh, in verse 3, nothing sinful will be there. There will be no temptation in heaven. We can just we can't hardly get out of bed anymore without some kind of temptation coming up from Satan. And he knows just where to tempt us, where we're most vulnerable. That won't be in heaven anymore. We've lived, a, we've lived with temptation all our life. Hopefully, we've learned to go away from temptation, resist it, and turn to, to Jesus. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, his battle with temptation, even after he was saved, he said, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I want to do, I, and what I, I don't want to do, I seem to be doing, and just wrestling with temptation in his life and sin that he has to wrestle, wrestle with. But he said, but he turns to Jesus, and Jesus forgives. So we'll be restored when we're in heaven. Another blessing in verse 3, the latter part of verse 3, verse 4, Jesus will be there. In heaven, What a blessing that will be. The throne of God and the Lamb. Wherever Jesus is, that's where we'll be. And that's where the party will be centered. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of description of heaven. We all wonder sometimes what it will be like. What does a street of gold look like? I don't know, but I know if you see even a small gold coin, that's a beautiful thing. Think about a whole street of that. If you see a pearl... Little bitty pearl, that's a beautiful thing. Think about a gate, a whole gate made out of pearl. Our son's a geologist. He has some, a lot of semi-precious stones. He's collected at different mines and places. And, and look at some of those, and they're beautiful stones. And, but that's a little bitty stone. What if it's a massive stone? Heaven's going to be so wonderful when we get there. And then verse 4, another blessing. 
Not only will we be in heaven with Jesus, but we will see him face to face. Remember when Moses wanted to see God's face and asked to see God's face, God said, well, you stand here and I'm going to cover your face when I go by, but you can see my back. That's all Moses saw was the back of Jesus. We'll see the face of Jesus. What a difference it will be. And the reason is Moses had sin in his life, as we do. But in heaven, all that's taken away. And there's a purity of our life that will be in heaven that we can't imagine right now, but we'll have a purity and a cleansing and a righteousness that we're allowed to look at the face of God. In verse 5 is another blessing. There'll be no more darkness. There'll be no need for a lamp. There'll be no need for the sun or the moon because the glory of God is going to be so bright it's going to fill the earth with with light. And, and if you look in um, Genesis Chapter 1, when God was creating, there was light in the world before God created the sun and moon and stars. And that'll be, we'll go back to that, the light will be from Him, emanating, shining forth. Uh, darkness is a place to hide. Criminals come out at night. You're trying to be deceitful, you, you hide it, it's dark. But that's not going to be in heaven. It will always be light. In chapter, or, or verse 5, the latter part, another blessing. We will reign with him forever and ever. Now, I've heard some talk about the reigning. In 2 Timothy 2, if we endure, we'll also reign with him. And I've heard some talk about reigning like we're going to be on the winning side and we're going to go out and we're going to go out and bust some heads and we're going to be in charge. And But that's not what it's going to be. To reign with him means we're on his team. To reign with him doesn't mean we're going to share his throne it's going to be, we're, one, we're there serving him. We're going to be there for him. And we're part of his kingdom. When Jesus battles Satan, all the host of angels that are still in heaven will be with him. All the host of those who are, have had faith and were raptured will be with him. But Jesus fights the battle alone. We don't go fight it. And he conquers Satan in an instant, just that quick. And we, we are his servants. And we'll serve him. And be part of his kingdom. And by saying that, we're reigning with Christ. Not reigning with Satan. We're reigning with Christ. We're on his side. And we'll be there. Uh, we will reign with him by being with him. By serving him. And being part of his team. That's how we will reign with him. Before sin came into the world, Adam and Eve were in the garden. And they did their work. And they enjoyed it. Somebody once said, if you enjoy your work, you never work a day in your life. Because you enjoy it so much. And there's a lot of truth to that. But then Adam and Eve sinned. And part of the curse for Adam would be, work would be by the sweat of his brow. It would be difficult. And we found work to be difficult and hard and all that. But when all the curse is removed, we'll have plenty of work to do when we're in heaven for all eternity. There's stuff to do. But it's going to be such a joy to do it that we won't even notice we're working. And all the work that we do is going to come out of worship. And all the work we do is going to go back into worship. Have you ever thought about when you spend your week working for Jesus in, in your secular job? When you have a secular job, but you're working for Jesus because you're giving your heart and life to Jesus and you're living for him. You're ready to come to church on Sunday. It's a joy to put your tithe in the offering plate because you work for Jesus. And you're there, and it may, you may have some difficult days, but you turn that over to the Lord and say, Lord, help me through this. And, and you say, my job is for you, Lord. Every morning you pray the Lord bless as you work there, and you come, and you're just ready to worship. Because you've worshipped all week long, even though it's a secular job. You've worshipped. You've given it to the Lord. And it's your gift to Him is to come and sit in His presence with others. And imagine a whole congregation that has done that in the Spirit of Christ gone out into the world. And then come together on Sunday. That's how heaven is going to be only on steroids. Because it's not going to be by the sweat of our brow we have to work. It's going to be in the joy of serving God that we do our work. And it's going to be a wonderful time. A wonderful place in heaven. So we are able to serve Christ now. Through the Holy Spirit in our life. We receive spiritual gifts. Paul wrote about that to the Romans and to the Galatians, he wrote about our spiritual gifts and how we are enabled to serve him even now. So when we serve God through our spiritual gifts and we recognize that, 
that leads to worship. So how do we get these blessings? Those are some good blessings. How do we get them? First of all, we have to overcome temptation. We have to overcome this world. John wrote to the seven churches what they need to overcome. In Ephesus, they needed to overcome apathy. They'd become a little complacent. In Smyrna, they had to overcome persecution. In Pergamum, false teaching. In Thyatira, sexual immorality. In Philadelphia, complacency. In Laodicea, self-reliance. Think about it in your own life. Have you become apathetic or complacent toward God, toward your service of God? What about with your spiritual disciplines? Are you still excited about opening your Bible every day and reading it, the Word of God, and letting it speak to you, not just reading it so you can check it off, but letting it speak to you? Are you still excited about that? Talking about your faith with others, are you still doing that? Are you excited about telling others that you accepted Jesus as your Savior? What about when the nominating committee will call you and say, we'd like you to serve in this position. Do you get excited about serving God and, and saying, wow, the committee wants me to serve in this way and God has led that, uh, made that happen and, and I'm going to be excited about it. And, think, and then you think, well, I don't know how to do that, but I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to do the best I can. For those of you that are already on positions, you'll be asked to serve in those same positions again, perhaps. Are you saying, I'm going to do, the, I'm going to do better this year than I did last year in that position? Are you still excited about it? Or have you become complacent? Saying, yeah, I've done that for several years. I know how to do that. I'll do it again. I've heard that a lot. Where are you? Are you complacent? Uh, we have to be careful of false teaching, too. And particularly in our world today, because we have Facebook and we have Internet, and you can read just about anything you, you can imagine. Do you have false teaching? When there's false teaching, it warps your worldview, your spiritual worldview. And so you don't see things quite right like they ought to be biblically understood. You see them just a little bit different. I was working with a surveyor one time, and he went out and started a survey, and he was just a little bit off, not much. It didn't really matter much, the first 10 feet or 100 feet. But he surveyed a mile. And when he was at the end of that mile, he was way off because he started just a little bit off. And if you're just a little bit off spiritually, a little bit off with your doctrine, you're going to end up way off base down the road, given some time. We have to stay biblically accurate. And the other one, Laodicea had self-reliance. That's another thing I've seen in a lot of churches, Christians becoming self-reliant. How many times have you observed the Lord's Supper? How many times have you observed baptism? How many times have we been through different programs of the church? And so much that you have memorized, you know how to do church, and you think you're self-reliant. You become a, come to a place in life, your children are grown, they're successful, they have grandchildren, and you, you have good grandchildren, and you are successful in business, and you have your 401ks real nice, and you're, you become self-reliant. You say, I don't need the church so much anymore. I'm not desperate like I used to be. The problem is, God has blessed you with all that so you can bless others who are struggling. And you need to be in church so that you can help others who are in church who are struggling in some of those areas that you've mastered because you've had all those years to do it. Have you become self-reliant? Those who become self-reliant also become lax in the spiritual discipline. We have to be careful about that. Satan has tricks, his pressure to conform to the world. You know, it's okay to be a Christian, just don't be so excited about it. You ever hear that? Or using false teaching to skew a church in a wrong direction. We're tempted to become complacent and just not take part. I knew a man one time, and he just said, I, I just want to come. I don't want to know anything that's going on. I'm going to come, and I'm going to go home, and I don't want to know anything. Actually, I've heard several people say that through the years. That's complacency. And then the self-reliant. I talked to a lady in Texas. Um, on the way back, we were at the gas station. She was pumping on the other side of the gas pump. And she said they were going home and from vacation, and she was going to go to her doctor that her cancer has returned, and she's going to have to go back and have more treatment. And I said, well, are you a Christian lady? He said, yes, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. And what kind of Christian is that? That's a complacent, self-reliant Christian. 
And Paul wrote, or John wrote to the churches and said, you need to repent of being complacent. You need to repent of being self-reliant, and you need to turn back to the Lord. We are called to be conqueror of these temptations in life. The apathy, persecution, false teaching, sexual immorality, complacency, and self-reliance. We are called to conquer these things in our life, not submit to them or succumb to them. We're to, to be greater than them. And he said, the one who overcomes these will be blessed. You want to receive these blessings, you have to overcome these. You don't drift on out into eternity. You serve faithfully on out into eternity. Each one of the seven churches was promised a blessing if they overcame these temptations. We're not called to be spectators. We're called to repent and turn back to Christ. So to receive the blessings, we must endure. That is, finish strongly. We are called to endure. And I wonder how many Christians drop out and don't finish the race of Christianity. You probably know some that have dropped out through the years. How many are in the community that they're members of a church somewhere, but they're not going anywhere and just seem to be complacent. Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Are you planning to finish strongly in your Christian life, or are you just planning to kind of... Um, just let life happen. Be complacent. We need to finish strongly. We need to be alert spiritually to get the blessings. We need to be ready for the return of Christ. We are ready when he find, comes back and finds us still working, still serving, still engaged in his word and letting it speak to us, still overcoming the, the shortcomings in our life, the old sinful nature that rises up. We're to overcome that. When you're consistently reading your Bible, you're learning what you need to be aware of. You're learning where the world is and how to re respond to it and live in it. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Are you leaning towards secular society more and more because that's where your heart is? Or are you leaning more and more toward Jesus Christ because that's where your heart is? Be careful when you begin to drift away from the Lord. Be careful. Begin, you, you may drift away from practicing spiritual disciplines. You need to be careful about that. And if you, one way to measure is how much are you reading your Bible? How much are you attending church? Now, y'all are here every week. I know you are. And how much are you sharing with others? How much are you talking about spiritual things in the home? If you're not doing any of that, you've drifted. And according to what John wrote, you need to beware and come back. Come back by starting to read your Bible. Well, I tried that. I picked it up, read it. It just didn't mean anything. Just try it again tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And every day, keep on until it does mean something. And you'll find that it'll be worth the effort. And then we need to be separate. We need to be in the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. And that is, we live in the world. We rub shoulders with people who are secular. But we don't let that secularism come into our minds and our thinking and our ways. And we can do it. There are a lot of secular things that it doesn't matter. What you know, you can go to a, a, a fireworks display somewhere. It doesn't matter if a Christian's there or not. Probably a good thing to be there and share Christ. But then there are some places a Christian ought not to be found, like in a casino. Now, I don't know if I don't know anybody in here who goes to a casino. I won't make that straight. I'm not pointing at anybody, but that would be one place. Or bar rooms. There are exceptions to both of those if you're ministering really ministering, but if that's the desire of your heart to be in those kind of secular places, that's not a good indication of your walk with the Lord. If your desire, on the other hand, you're traveling and you make plans to stop in at a church on the roadside, uh, as you travel, you find one to worship, that's a good indication. Maybe you're looking for the Lord, seeking Him and serving Him, and you might be a blessing to that church along the way. And so, where is your heart? We need to be in the world, but not of the world. In the book of Revelation, there are two systems. The system that Satan puts forth and offers and the system that God puts forth and offers. You can't be part of both systems. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. You, you make your mind one way or the other. So don't tie your personal happiness to the things of the world, or what the world says is important, but keep trusting in the truth of God. In verse 12 through 14, Jesus speaks, Rewards are conditional. And he said, blessed 
are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the, the gates into the city blessed. Do you want blessing? You need Jesus in your life. Only Jesus can wash away your sin. You can turn over a leaf, a new leaf, every day of your life, and you're not, you still have that old sin nature. When Jesus comes in your life, he washes away the sin nature, not the sins you've done, and, and just turn over a new leaf. He washes away the new nature, that old nature so you have no longer desire to sin, and he cleanses all unrighteousness in your life. In verse 17, it's the most important verse in the whole Bible, the spirit and the bride say, come. Now think about from Genesis to Revelation, man is put in the Garden of Eden, and man and, and woman in the Garden of Eden, they choose to sin, sin comes in the world, and sin wreaks havoc in the world, and so um, at a certain point the world is so corrupt, God says to Noah, you're the only righteous one left, you and your family, build an ark, get into it, I'm going to cleanse the earth, I'm going to, I'm going to destroy everything, and he did. Noah got out of the ark and he refilled the earth, they were, they were abundant, they, were, they multiplied and they filled the earth. And the world has become evil again. So Jesus came into this world and died on the cross for the sin nature of mankind. All of mankind. Every language, tongue, tribe. Every person. Jesus died for our sins. And so that through Jesus we could have a sin free life in heaven in eternity. A righteous life. And now we have that choice. Through Jesus. He says, come. Come. If any will come to, Jesus says, if anyone will come to me, I will give them eternal life. But you have to come. You have to be willing to receive. You have to be willing to repent from your ways, your desires, and trust in Jesus and his way. And when you do that, then you receive the blessings. Somebody said, the evidence that you repented long ago when you said you did is because you're still repenting now and even to a greater degree. Someone that is, who becomes offended because a preacher says you need to repent probably never repented. We need to repent, that is, change directions from the way of living our own life, our own sin nature, and we repent toward the ways of God. And we just grow in that and grow in that and grow in that every day. Have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior? Have you repented of living life your way and trusted in living life God's way? That's what it's about. And that's what he offers us today with this most important verse, come. A simple one-word invitation, come. He said, come to me and you'll have eternal life. Mm -hmm.